the inverse of a function undoes what the function does. So the inverse of tying your shoes would be to untie them. And the inverse of the function that adds 2 to a number would be the function that subtracts 2 from a number. This video introduces inverses and their properties. Suppose f of x is the function defined by this chart. In other words, f of 2 is 3, f of 3 is 5, f of 4 is 6, and f of 5 is 1. The inverse function for f, written f superscript negative 1 x, undoes what f does. Since f takes 2 to 3, f inverse takes 3 back to 2. So we write this f superscript negative 1 of 3 is 2. Similarly, since f takes 3 to 5, f inverse takes 5 to 3. And since f takes 4 to 6, f inverse of 6 is 4. And since f takes 5 to 1, f inverse of 1 is 5. I'll use these numbers to fill in the chart. Notice that the chart of values when y equals f of x and the chart of values when y equals f inverse of x are closely related. They share the same numbers, but the x values for f of x correspond to the y values for f inverse of x, and the y values for f of x correspond to the x values for f inverse of x. That leads us to the first key fact. Inverse functions reverse the roles of y and x. I'm going to plot the points for y equals f of x in blue. Next I'll plot the points for y equals f inverse of x in red. Pause the video for a moment and see what kind of symmetry you observe in this graph. How are the blue points related to the red points? You might have noticed that the blue points and the red points are mirror images. Over the mirror line, y equals x. So our second key fact is that the graph of y equals f inverse of x can be obtained from the graph of y equals f of x by reflecting over the line y equals x. This makes sense because inverses reverse the roles of y and x. In this same example, let's compute f inverse of f of 2. This open circle means composition. In other words, we're computing f inverse of f of 2. We compute this from the inside out, so that's f inverse of 3, since f of 2 is 3, and f inverse of 3 we see is 2. Similarly, we can compute f of f inverse of 3, and that means we take f of f inverse of 3, since f inverse of 3 is 2, that's the same thing as computing f of 2, which is 3. Please pause the video for a moment and compute these other compositions. You should have found that in every case, if you take f inverse of f of a number, you get back to the very same number you started with. And similarly, if you take f of f inverse of any number, you get back to the same number you started with. So in general, f inverse of f of x is equal to x, and f of f inverse of x is also equal to x. This is the mathematical way of saying that f and inverse, f inverse undo each other. Let's look at a different example. Suppose that f of x is x cubed. Pause the video for a moment and guess what the inverse of f should be. Remember, f inverse undoes the work that f does. You might have guessed that f inverse of x is going to be the cube root function. And we can check that this is true by looking at f of f inverse of x. That's f of the cube root of function, which means the cube root function cubed, which gets us back to x. Similarly, if we compute f inverse of f of x, that's the cube root of x cubed, and we get back to x again. So the cube root function really is the inverse of the cubing function. When we compose the two functions, we get back to the number that we started with.
It'd be nice to have a more systematic way of finding inverses of functions besides guessing and checking. One method uses the fact that inverses reverse the roles of y and x. So if we want to find the inverse of the function f of x equals 5 minus x over 3x, we can write it as y equals 5 minus x over 3x, reverse the roles of y and x to get x equals 5 minus y over 3y, and then solve for y. To solve for y, let's multiply both sides by 3y, bring all terms with y's in them to the left side, and all terms without y's in them to the right side, factor out the y, and divide to isolate y. This gives us f inverse of x as 5 over 3x plus 1. Notice that our original function, f, and our inverse function, f inverse, are both rational functions, but they're not the reciprocals of each other. And in general, f inverse of x is not usually equal to 1 over f of x. This can be confusing because when we write 2 to the minus 1, that does mean 1 over 2, but f to the minus 1 of x means the inverse function and not the reciprocal. It's natural to ask if all functions have inverse functions. That is, for any function you might encounter, is there always a function that it's, is its inverse? In fact, the answer is no. See if you can come up with an example of a function that does not have an inverse function. The word function here is key. Remember that a function is a relationship between x values and y values such that for each x value in the domain there is only one corresponding y value. One example of a function that does not have an inverse function is the function f of x equals x squared. To see that the inverse of this function is not a function, note that for the x squared function, the number 2 and the number negative 2 both go to the number 4. So if I had an inverse, it would have to send 4 to both 2 and negative 2. The inverse would not be a function. It might be easier to understand the problem when you look at a graph of y equals x squared. Recall that inverse functions reverse the roles of y and x and flip the graph over the line y equals x. But when I flip the green graph over the line y equals x, I get this red graph. This red graph is not the graph of a function because it violates the vertical line test. The reason it violates the vertical line test is because the original green function violates the horizontal line test and has two x values with the same y value. In general, a function f has an inverse function if and only if the graph of f satisfies the horizontal line test, i.e. every horizontal line intersects the graph in at most one point. Pause the video for a moment and see which of these four graphs satisfy the horizontal line test. In other words, which of the four corresponding functions would have an inverse function? You may have found that graphs A and B violate the horizontal line test, so their functions would not have inverse functions. But graphs C and D satisfy the horizontal line test, so these graphs represent functions that do have inverses. Functions that satisfy the horizontal line test are sometimes called one-to-one -one functions. Equivalently, a function is one-to-one -one if for any two different x values, x1 and x2, the y values f of x1 and f of x2 are different numbers. Sometimes this is said f is one-to-one -one if whenever f of x1 is equal to f of x2, then x1 has to equal x2. As our last example, let's try to find p inverse of x, where p of x is the square root of x minus 2, 
drawn here. If we graph P inverse on the same axis as P of X, we get the following graph, simply by flipping over the line Y equals X. If we try to solve the problem algebraically, we can write Y equal to the square root of X minus 2, reverse the roles of Y and X, and solve for Y by squaring both sides and adding 2. Now if we were to graph y equals x squared plus 2, that would look like a parabola. It would look like the red graph we've already drawn together with another arm on the left side. But we know that our actual inverse function consists only of this right arm. We can specify this algebraically by making the restriction that x has to be bigger than or equal to zero. This corresponds to the fact that on the original graph for the square root of x, y was only greater than or equal to zero. Looking more closely at the domain and range of p and p inverse, we know that the domain of p is all values of x such that x minus 2 is greater than or equal to zero, since we can't take the square root of a negative number. This corresponds to x values being greater than or equal to 2, or an interval notation, the interval from 2 to infinity. The range of p, we can see from the graph, is all y values greater than or equal to 0, or the interval from 0 to infinity. Similarly, based on the graph, we see the domain of p inverse is x values greater than or equal to 0, the interval from 0 to infinity, and the range of p inverse is y values greater than or equal to 2, or the interval from 2 to infinity. If you look closely at these domains and ranges, you'll notice that the domain of p corresponds exactly to the range of p inverse, and the range of p corresponds to the domain of p inverse. This makes sense because inverse functions reverse the roles of y and x. The domain of f inverse of x is the x values for f inverse, which corresponds to the y values, or the range of f. The range of f inverse is the y values for f inverse, which correspond to the x values, or the domain of f. In this video, we discussed five key properties of inverse functions. Inverse functions reverse the roles of y and x graph of y equals f inverse of x is the graph of y equals f of x reflected over the line y equals x. When we compose f with f inverse, we get the identity function y equals x. And similarly, when we compose f inverse with f, that brings x to x. In other words, f and f inverse undo each other. The function f of x has an inverse function if and only if the graph of y equals f of x satisfies the horizontal line test. And finally, the domain of f is the range of f inverse and the range of f is the domain of f inverse. These properties of inverse functions will be important when we study exponential functions and their inverses, logarithmic functions.